time and said once more, Father dear, we come to you at the close to give thanks for what you have done for us through the day, giving us of thy fresh air to breathe and food to eat, raiment to wear. We pray now, Father, as we gather tonight to worship you here in the church, that you'll send Jesus to us. May we be comforted by his presence and his great works may be manifested in our midst. Bless this church, bless the pastor, every church that's represented here and every person. Grant it, Lord. At the close of the service, we'll bow our head humbly, give thee the praise. We ask that you'll save sinners, call backsliders back to the fold, heal the sick and the needy and the wounded and blind. Grant it, Father. We ask all this for God's glory, in the name of his own dear child, Jesus Christ. Amen. Seated. Lord bless you. It's another privilege that we have tonight of being in the house of God. And we're rejoicing from last evening's service. They, they were telling me this today that the Lord did great things here last night <clears throat> in the midst of it. And I am very grateful to God. I understand that in the morning I'm to speak at the Christian businessman's breakfast. And uh, we usually have a good time there where those businessmen meet together, <clears throat> pardon me, and we talk of the Lord Jesus and uh, his glory. This group of men, a full gospel businessmen, Christians internationally, has certainly been a blessing to me and the work of the Lord. They have helped sponsor me many great places and places all over the world. And I'm very happy for the privilege of getting to speak to them, or speak for them in the morning, to the glory of God. And I think it's... I don't know how, whether the public is invited or whether it's just for Christian businessmen and wives. I don't know. Perhaps they've already announced that, whatever it is. <clears throat> and then tomorrow night, I believe we begin at the Lane Tech. Lane Tech. I got a call from my wife a while ago, and she, a minister friend of mine, Mr. O'Bannon, uh, come up, and he's been around the Lane Tech ever since, I think, trying to wait for the services to open. And, so he, we couldn't find him at the hotel. We left a note there. He's probably stepped out and for him to call us. The Lane Tech. But tomorrow night, uh, the service is really started. Is that official, Brother <laughs> Brother Jose? And uh, so tomorrow night, it's the Lane Tech. And then Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening. And then from there, we go to Columbia, uh, North Carolina, to begin the services there. I think that's North Carolina, Columbia, South, North, South, South Carolina. I get the, of all my travels, and pretty near everywhere in the world, and I have never yet been in North or South Carolina. Never set a foot on the ground in North and South Carolina. The only states in the Union that I have not been in is North and South Carolina. And so now tonight, last evening, I held you a little late, and the Holy Spirit was here with doing exceedingly abundantly. A very noted Baptist minister friend of mine was sitting in the audience last night who met with me today and said, Brother Branham, that's what I call a real apostolic service. Right. Right. And uh, he said, if the Baptists could only see that, they would come in right now. Right. <laughs> so uh, they, uh, he's been a friend of mine for a long time. <laughs> And uh, he's a very outstanding man among the Baptist people. And now, in Mexico, it was the Baptist church that sponsored our meeting, that Baptist and Presbyterian, and all, of course, all the rest of the evangelicals together. And now, in America here, we find that many of our churches in those large denominations, they... they just simply got so many overseers, so they just can't accept uh, the Holy Spirit in his work. And uh, 
But when you take out on the battlefront, now I'm speaking this to the full gospel people, you'd never know whether he was a Baptist, Presbyterian, or a Pentecostal. You'd never know the difference, because they're all the same. They have to pull hard and pray. But we here, we go over and pay our pastor a good salary, and if he speaks over 20 minutes, we have him up on the board and find out why. So, and if he says anything about it, he's excommunicated. He's taken right from the church, and if he kicks up about that, the denomination pushes him right out. That's it. Root hog or die. But now that's the way it is. So we do, see, we we know it all. See? But those people there, whether they're Presbyterian, Methodist, or whatever they are, they have to pray and stay before God, and that makes them spiritual. So don't worry. God's got some children out in there. There's going to be a great pressure come one of these days through you. You're going to have to pray. We don't know what it is to run into a bomb shelter or go home and no home there. And mother run down the street with a baby in her arms and fry with a bomb dropping in the street. And we don't know what those things are, you see. But it won't be long. We'll know what they are. And then you'll pray then. And you'll, you'll really seek God. It won't be a 20 minutes, a little pacified, made-up sermon about some dignitary somewhere. It'll be the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the resurrection. And you'll be crying for supernatural and everything else when them times come. You know that homemade, self-made, documented religion's all right to live by, but it's terrible to die by. <laughs> I've done seen it come to the end too many times. It just won't work. It just doesn't work. And I've seen it many times that the doctor shooting hypos in the arm to try to stop a deathbed confession. That's right, of people who's dying and stand there and watch them die. And them trying to say, I'm, I'm sinful, I, I, I'm lost. And, and the pastor say, you better give her another hypo right quick because she is delirious. She isn't delirious. She just knows she's been wrong and she's trying to find peace, that's all. It'll tell at the end of the road. And if you're ever sincere in your life, you'll sure be when death strikes you. That's one thing sure. So isn't it wonderful to know that it's all settled? I, I just love it, don't you? Just that perfect satisfaction and know that His Spirit lives in you, bearing record of the resurrected Jesus Christ and right living friendship with Him every day. Not trying to live this or that, but Him in you just lives His own life out, going where He wants you to go, saying what He wants you to say, doing what He wants you to do. That's the way to live, isn't it? And you people who are living that way, God bless you, my dear brother and sister. And just strive and pray for others to come into the wonderful faith in Christ Jesus. I, if the man is here tonight, I hope he doesn't take this as an offense. I hope he takes it in, in the way of uh, love. A fellow called me up. He said, Brother Branham, I'd like to make a contact with you. I said, well, I tell you, brother, I don't have anything to do with the appointments, and especially while we're having healing services. I kind of stay alone most of the day and pray, study, submitting myself and yielding myself to the Holy Spirit. He said, but I, <coughs> I, I want to make a contact with you the way you make a contact on the platform. I said, uh, what's the matter? He said, well, I've got a loved one that's sick, and said, I... <coughs> I, I want him healed. And I said, well, now, you know, I'm not the healer. And he said, well, I, I, I want to make the contact the way them people does out in the audience and make the contact because uh, he had noticed many people that had come from his community that had been healed by that, just making the contact. I said, brother, it's not contacting me, I'm sure. It's contacting Christ. He said, how do I do that? I said, by believing him. That's right. By believing and resting your faith upon his finished works. That's it. And every true, genuine gift of God will point to Calvary on the finished works of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no one can heal. There's no one can save. There's no one can add one thing to salvation. Not a thing. And that's the reason... I'm speaking tonight for a few moments on the subject that I aim to, to speak on here tonight, the infallible Word of God. Right. 
There is a time where we have to take out the blueprints to find out how far up the road we are, how close the building is being completed. And I, for myself, I know along with many and all the believers in here, rest our eternal destination solemnly upon the Word of God. That's all. And anything outside of that, I would not say I do not believe it. I would say this, I do not understand it. It must come by the Word. Now, in Matthew, the 24th chapter, and beginning with the, with the 34th and 35th verse, I read this. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass, so all these things be fulfilled. Heavens and earth pass away, but my word shall not pass away. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Now, in the Old Testament, God had about three ways that he could make the people understand his message or bring a message to the people. Now, the first thing you want to recognize is first you have to have solemn faith in the Bible. I was talking to a psychologist not long ago, and he said, well, Mr. Branham, he said, if uh, a man believed that he could walk out here and touch a pole or a tree and be healed, it would happen. I said, who in the world would have faith to know that he touched a pole or a tree, he'd be healed? Faith is not built upon such shifting sands as that. Faith has its firm resting place on the eternal rock of God's Word, and not upon the shifting sands of man's theology, but upon God's eternal Word. Faith has to have a resting place. Am I looking at the little alcoholic that was healed in the Hammond meeting? God bless you, sister. I just happened to recognize you. I can't think of your name right now, and yet I've seen you and talked with you. One of the, uh, from, if it happened to be an alcoholic here tonight, and the alcoholic synonymous has failed and all. Here sits a beautiful little lady sitting here that was a past alcoholic synonymous and all. And Jesus Christ right. called her, made her well, solemnly, soberly, and sitting here now perfectly normal and well. And that's been two or three years ago, hasn't it? Four years ago. I wonder, sister, if you just stand up just for a minute. How many like to see her? Just raise your hand. There she is. An answer to the power of God. When God in the room called a little woman and told her what she was and who she was and the all about her and told her what she was and God taken the drink away from her right then. And she's not a glorifying her drinking, but she's glorifying Christ who took it from her. And if you think you can't get rid of cigarettes, tobacco, and dope and alcohol and things like that, talk to her a minute. <laughs> she can tell you where salvation lays. Now, oh yes, and the opium needle or anything else, marijuana, whatever it is, Christ delivers perfectly. Now, the, you can't rest your faith, as I say, upon just anything. You've got to have some basic facts. And the reason that I rest my faith upon this Word, because I believe it to be the Word of God. And then if it is the Word of God, it's God Himself in Word form. Right. Now, then if that's God Himself, and no man is any better than His Word. If I write you a declaration here tonight or something that I'll do, now I'm no better than that Word is. And that word is a part of me. It's my word. And if this is God's written word, it, it can be no less than God himself because he's obligated to his word. Now, you believe that? Uh, ministers, some time ago, when there's a group of men that just been in Stuart Hamilton, many of them having pictures taken, at a studio, they 
wanted me to come down and have a picture taken, and a young uh, a scholar was very scholarly, that's true, and he was uh, wanting to get the manager away from me because he knowed I had no education and he just picked me to pieces. So finally he managed a way to do it. And he said to the manager, Mr. Baxter, he said, if uh, you go on to the meeting, I want to speak with Mr. Branham just a moment. And he said, no, I can't do that. He said, Mr. Baxter, I'll have him there just in a little while if you'll just grant me this privilege because I want to talk to him and the meetings do at this time. So finally, yeah, Brother Baxter looked at me and I nodded my head to him. He went on. And he said, now, Mr. Branham, as a man, I admire you. But in your theology, you're as wrong as day is from night. <laughs> and I said, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> I said, but I, I like you too. <laughs> and so he said, I believe that you'd be honest enough to be proven wrong that you would accept it. I said, absolutely, Brother. Uh, he said, now as you're preaching said, and your uh, salvation message, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's all right. He said, but as your doctrine of divine healing, it's absolutely wrong. And he said, it's wrong with the scripture. And I said, well, I'm, I don't aim for it to be my brother. And he said, well, it is. It's absolutely wrong. And uh, I said, well, maybe then you could correct me. He said, do you preach divine healing by through the atonement? I said, every redemptive blessing has to come through the atonement, because that's how it was made. The attributes of the death of Jesus Christ brings us divine healing. And he said to me then, he said, now, Mr. Branham, do you apply that then to what Isaiah said, that he was wounded for our, yes, sir, that's right. He said, if I'll prove to you that that has been done away with. Will you accept it? I said, yes, sir. That's right. And he said, all right, in Matthew 8, the Bible said that they brought to him the lame, halt, and afflicted, and so forth. And he healed them that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken to the prophet Isaiah. <laughs> See, he, he, he himself bore our infirmities. I said, do you apply that to the atonement? He said, certainly, Isaiah said so. I said, that was a year and six months before the lamb was ever killed. Now, how could it be in the atonement? That was a year and six months before Jesus ever was crucified. And how do you apply that to the atonement? And then he went to rattling off big words. You know, and I said, now, just a moment. The King James is all I know, see. And so he said, well, well, I said, we won't. I said, do you, I'll ask you one question now. Do you say that divine healing is in the word about whatsoever things you desire? When you pray, believe you receive them. Is that divinely ordered in the Bible? Well, you have to say yes, because Jesus said so. Yes. Ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Anything, I'll do it. And uh, he said, yes. Oh, you said the wrong thing there, brother. <laughs> and you put it in the Word, not the atonement. And I said, then it has to be in the atonement, then, if it's in the Word. And he said, no. I said, wait, there was a king one time that had a great kingdom, and he made all the rules and laws. He's a just man, a man of honor. And he made rules uh, and, and penalties of punishment and so forth. And one day a slave committed a crime. He was brought up before the king, and the king said, my law reads here that you must die for this penalty. I'll have to take your head. And the poor fellow began shaking, and he said, uh, what can I do for you before I uh, have your head taken? And he said, a glass of water. So they give the slave the water, and he was shaking so hard he couldn't hold the water. He said, now before I take your life, you drink the water, or I, uh, I won't take your life until you drink the water. And a slave threw the water on the ground. I said, now what is the man going to do? His law says that that the man must die, but his word says that he's not going to take the man's life before he uh, drinks the water, and he can't drink the water. How long? He said, oh, that was a slip-up on the king. I said, and then you mean to say that God slipped up too when he put in his word and not the atonement? Get away from here with that. No, sir. It's, God doesn't have any slip-up. Every word is the truth. Amen. God 
God's Word. And a man's character is shown in his works. Or a man shows his, his character by his works. We know that. Just like a contractor. A contractor shows what he is by his works. For instance, we are going to have a great building built here in the city of Chicago. The first thing the officials of the city board would do, they would try to select the contractor, just not anyone that run in and said, well, I can do the job all right. right. You're going to get a contractor that's got a reputation. And now because if they didn't, maybe another contractor would underbid that contractor, but he would put in the building bad material, and perhaps he would build it thousands of dollars less. And then we come to find out that the building collapsed. The first storm hit it, it went down. What do you think the city would think about that contractor? It would ruin his reputation forever. Right. Right. Perhaps what if it had been a school building or something where many little children were seated in the school and uh, the bad material that was put in the building gave away and collapsed and killed hundreds of little children. What would those parents think of that contractor for the love of money, caring not about his reputation and done a job like that? Oh, my. They'd think he was a horrible person. And he would be. No doubt it has to be uh, what we would call a scallywag that would do a trick like that, put such uh, 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 goods and a building that had such a great price that it was to hold up, and then with so much in common of little children that had to be seated in here and would go and put bad materials in it, and the first thing you know, the foundations would give away and away it would go. He would be an awful person to do a thing like that. What do you think the Los Angeles people thought of that contractor who built the St. Francis Dam? About $25 million was put in it, a little lower than any of the other bidder. But all at once, when the floodwaters begin to press against the dam, the sandy conditions beneath it wasn't fit right. And the material that went into it was not the right kind of material. And while the valley is laid silent with sleeping people, trusting in that dam, the whole thing gave away and hundreds of people's lives was destroyed when the water swept down through that valley, taking the lives of the people. Now, in this... We would liken the Word of God. God is a great architect. He's a great builder. And God puts in His building nothing but the very best. And I would liken this to a story I read of the great uh, Sydney Bridge in Sydney, Australia. Many years ago when the they had decided to build a bridge across the great strait of water there that connected north and south Sydney. Many come to bid, but up into England came down a renowned contractor who had a reputation behind him that he, would, he wanted to build this bridge. Though his prices was high, the people of Sydney didn't mind that. They wanted the bridge Feel right. And I think every Christian ought to take the same attitude. Right. We want to know where we're standing. We don't want our eternal destination built up on the shifting sands of some church theology, but on the eternal word of the living God. Right. Because remember, every one of you sitting here tonight, stormy times is going to hit that building you're sitting in tonight. Right. Death's go to strike it, and you better know what kind of a sand it's built upon, or what kind of a foundation it has. God building the foundation would put nothing else but the best that there is, because God is thoughtful of his reputation. He's a God of eternity. He's a God of heavens and earth. He'll never put nothing in his 
architect, planter, but what will stand the time test for eternity. Amen. 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 Say, I better leave that text. That is, we get to shout and we get to thinking that. For that's just as true as God is true. Amen. And now, he puts the best, and that's his word. And that's where I rest my hopes on tonight. My hopes is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood with righteousness. Amen. All around my soul gives way. This rock will stand forever. Right? Yeah. God's eternal word. And today when we find out that in our great uh, economy and in our great civilization that we're living in, Many things are being built for popularity. Many houses are put up just in a, a row, slamming them together. Many bridges are built and other things that won't stand the test, cheap materials put in. And so is many churches built up on man-made theory and doctrines and dogmas that won't stand the test of God's Word. God's Word declares Jesus Christ to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Same in power, same in principle, same in healing, same as He ever was, He is now, and always was, and always will be. And His attitude has to be the same towards every case that He has dealt with, or He did wrong at the first time when He dealt with the case the way He did. Got to be. Notice, God using and creating His own material. God knew the very trees that would be cut out that went into the ark. When he spoke life into the, uh, the germ that came from the seed or in the seed that made the tree, he knew right then that was the material that he would use to save Noah and the family. God, before the foundation of the world, looked down through the stream of time and saw everything that would be. And therefore, he could call and elect those who he knew that he would put into his building. That's right. And if you've been called tonight by the Holy Ghost and given a chance to come into the kingdom of God, happy ought you to be. Amen. Amen. If you're in the kingdom of God and you're a part of the body of Christ, thanks be to God. You live the life. You do the things that's right. And remember, this might sink just a little bit rough when it goes down, but let it digest a while. If you're in the body of Christ, he does not have any amputation. No, his body's perfect. You don't need any amputation. Amen. That's the truth. You know, the other night preaching on the ladder, he doesn't take off an arm or a leg. When it's placed there, it's placed there. It's the right material. Be sure that you're placed right. There in the Old Testament, there was three ways they could learn whether it was God speaking or not. First was by a dreamer. First was the law. And then by a dreamer or a prophet. And then if they want to test that to see it was right, on the breastplate of Aaron was the light called Urim Thundam. And if a dreamer told his dream or a prophet prophesied and it didn't flash the lights on the Urim Thundam, that prophet was wrong. And now under the Aaronic priesthood, that Urim Thundam was gone, done away with. But under this priesthood, God in sundry times and diverse manners spoke to the prophet to the children by the prophets, but in this last day has spoke to us through his Son, Christ Jesus. And this Bible is God's Urim Thunder. And if a prophet prophesies, a preacher preaches, or a dreamer dreams a dream, or something is done that don't flash on that Bible, I just don't go for it, that's all. And the day when man with nail scars in their hand, pictures being taken to prove some person's popularity, Listen, if Jesus has left the heaven, the Bible said, when they say, Lo, he's in the desert, lo, he's here, believe it not, for as the lightning cometh from the east and shineth even into the west, so shall the Son of Man be when he comes, and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. See? 
All of this idea of oil running out of hands and blood coming through hands, divine, what happened to the blood of Jesus Christ? If anything else is divine, I tell you, any real gift of God will point to the finished works of God's eternal word on the Bible. Amen. Hear me, I speak, thus saith the Lord. Right. Go to the Word, stay in the Word, and watch. The Bible speaks it in the last days, things that rise up in false prophets to see the very elect, if possible. Keep it in the Word. Let it be from God's Word. If it's not from God's Word, don't believe it. Just walk away. Don't criticize it. Just walk away from it. Right. Don't listen to it. Now, when this great architect come down to build this bridge, the first thing that he did... He told him that he could do it, and he is a man of reputation. So what he did, the first thing after he was given the contract, he knew if he could ever build that bridge and make it successful, that his reputation would be greater than any reputation for building this famous bridge. So the first thing he done, he selected first the very best that he could find of architects of skilled labor, and everything that he went at, he test-proved everything. Even all the steel that went into the bridge, it all had to be considered how long it would stand the weather, how long it would stand the salt, how long it would stand the storm, and as the fire struck, how much, how much it would expand in hot weather, and everything had to be tested. That's the way God did when he made this salvation bridge for us to cross from earth to glory. He tested. Every servant that comes to him must be time-tested and proven. Every son that cometh to God must first be tried of God and tested. Child trained and brought into Christ must first be tried. The prophets must first be tried. He said, if a prophet speaks something and that what he says comes out to pass, don't we hear him? It's a time-tested thing. And if that man building that bridge so time-tested everything, even to the bolts that he put into the bridge, he put a magnet on them to see if they were genuine steel or not. When he went to fix the great tower, they said that in the middle of the waters, they said that it taken him, I don't know how long, to sink this pile them down into there and to be sure that nobody lost their life in doing it as far as humanly possible. And he dug down. He struck one layer. He tested the stone. It wasn't the right kind. He blowed deeper and deeper and deeper because he knows this great arch out here in the middle would be the thing that would give that on the bridge it has to to be set on the right kind of rock. How God did that when between the Old and New Testament he spanned his plan of salvation he hosted up an ensign on Golgotha's hill none other than the Son of God that joined man to God. It was time tested. He tested it through the seed of Abraham on down to Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, down to David, and on down to the end until that perfect seed comes that could stand in the middle and hold sinner on one end and God on the other and bridge the way. Every word that he spoke, every word that was placed into the Bible was time-tested by the Holy Ghost. Therefore, I believe every timber. Yeah. Amen. Every precept of God is right. Everything that's written in this Bible, I'd be willing to lay my life down for it. Wow. I may not have faith enough to make every promise come true, but I'll never stand in somebody else's way who does have faith to do it. If I can't walk where Enoch walked one day and went home without dying, I wouldn't stand in somebody else's way who could walk that way with God. That's right. I'm tested and I believe that every word of God is pure and unadulterated for God is putting his timber because he's positive that his reputation as a savior will not be spoiled. Right. I'm tested it. Know that it was right. How that many while this bridge was going up, many prophesied and said it'll fall down. It'll fall down. How that those severe 
went forth and they checked everything to be sure of coming from both shores to meet out here in the middle, how everything must be perfect, must meet there just within the eighth of an inch or an inch so that it would come together just right. And on the day of the coming together, when both ends were joined together, she called the man had done all that he could do with the reputation he had. He had planned it so perfectly that both ends come together within an inch apart, each one, perfect as it could be. How the people screamed and shouted when they know the job was completed. And how the people today who's lost and undone without Christ, how we can rejoice and praise God that the expansion was met right when God sent Jesus Christ to the earth and he died at Calvary to bridge the way for sinful men and women to meet their Redeemer and their Maker. And none other is this bridge but Almighty God Himself. His Word is Him Himself. And He laid His own life down that we could walk over Him into glory. One end of the bridge was nothing else but Emmanuel, God with us. At the other end of the bridge is the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ who stands in the power and glory of the Father. Amen. The connection is right. His word, ever Old Testament prophecy pointed straight to Calvary. Ever New Testament prophecy points back to the finished work at Calvary. And why would we here in the last days try to point off to something else? It would be right. It would be wrong. If a man raised up to say, yeah, i got power to heal. He's wrong. If a man raised up to say, this oral is divine. Wrong. The blood coming out of a person, as it's been said in many places, of these things taking place, that's wrong. There's not a thing that any man or any woman or anybody else can do towards your salvation or your healing, but point you to the cross where the power of God crucified Jesus Christ there, and he was raised up the third day for our justification, and there was the great supreme price paid, that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace was up on him, and with his stripes we were healed. Where? At the expansion, the great tower in the middle of the river, this great gulf that reaches from this earth to glory. Christ is that tower. Did you notice? He couldn't die on earth and he couldn't die in heaven, so he was the bridge between. He died between heavens and earth. The very best material that God could put, he spoke to the prophets and said it will be in there. He reserved the seed. Thy seed shall bruise the serpent's head. And he did it. Amen. He did it. And the same God that said that promise, he had sent Jesus Christ a second time for those who wait for his coming and love his coming. The same God that said that, said that he would heal our sicknesses if we would believe him through our, uh, the atonement that was made there in the middle of the river. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. Sure. He was the one who paid the price. He was the one who's done all these things for us. The day that the bridge was completed. The people screamed and shouted all over the city, all over the country, because the bridge was then fixed. And if you don't believe they screamed and shouted, read Acts 2. When the bridge was completed, that spanned man back into relationship with God, finds out if there wasn't not only that, but come rolling down that bridge, come divine gifts from God out of heaven. And anoint the church to preach the gospel into all parts of the world. Amen. In Sydney, when the great final day come, as the expansion was made, everybody went out and they decorated the bridge with flags and so forth, giving honor. And then the great crucial moment come. The ribbon was straight to the cross. The governor, the mayor, rather was the first one to break the ribbon as he went across. What's the bridge going to do? Without one speck of doubt in his mind, he broke the ribbon because he had confidence in the builder and the material that went in it. Some of these days, you've got to break the ribbon too, brother. 
That's uh, right. It spans the side from the other. You're walking on brittle treads, and you don't know what time they'll break. That is true. But when the, the ribbon does break, I've got confidence in the tower and in the bridge that was planted far highway for us to travel from earth to glory. And the mayor broke the, and after he broke the way, hundreds of others followed him, loads of people, three or four great big electric trains chugged along on each side, not a doubt in their minds. And all behind there come tens of thousands of automobiles and walking pedestrians and all going across the bridge. And someday when life is all over, as we break them brittle threads and we see the Lord Jesus Christ coming in his power and glory, at the other side, when north and south Sydney was torn together by one expansion, and when Jesus died at Calvary, it Panted expansion that joined God and man together. That man are still the sons and daughters of God. Is in man because Jesus Christ spanned the way. Yeah. That's my confidence in His word. How He did it. Then when He, at that day, when they went across the bridge, the screams, the shouts, and the bridge set solid. There was not a weave in it at all. Because why? The right material had been put in. The right thing had been done. The right precautions had been taken. And of man, how his fame was through all out the world, the papers packed it everywhere, and he was the most famous bridge builder in the world at the time because he took precautions. He put the best material. He wasn't thinking about the price. He was thinking about the bridge. And then if man will be so concerned for transportation of his fellow man, to take such precautions as that, how much more is God concerned about his own children? To take precautions that the right thing is said, so therefore, brother, our faith is anchored in the word of the living God. And when Jesus Christ said, the things that I do shall you also, even more than this, for I go unto my Father, I believe that to be the infallible word of God. I believe when he said a little while, and the world will see me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you to the end of the world. I believe that's the infallible word of God. And I believe that he promised that wherever two or three gather together, he'd be in their midst. That's the infallible material of God that my hopes is built in tonight that takes us from this earth to glory. Hallelujah. I believe it to be the truth. I believe Jesus Christ died and rose again. I believe Jesus Christ lives tonight. I believe it's Jesus Christ that gave that blind woman her sight last night. I believe it's Jesus Christ raised that dead baby up down here in Mexico a few days ago. I believe it's Jesus Christ that's in our midst tonight. That's making our hearts feel light and joyful. That's giving us this great joy that we have and peace of knowing that we've anchored our soul in a haven of rest to sail the wild seas no more. The tempest may sweep over the wild stormy deep, but in Jesus that power we're anchored evermore. Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yes, sir, the spiritual divine revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Bible said no man can say Jesus is the Christ only by the witness of the Holy Ghost. And if you deny the Holy Ghost exists, if you deny there's no such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost, how can you believe in Jesus Christ? Only by a historical standpoint you can believe it. But when you have received Christ the Holy Spirit into your heart and been regenerated and born anew, then the Holy Ghost itself bears record. And that's the reason people today that can believe in divine healing and the supernatural because the very God that made the Word created it has sent His own Spirit in the heart to vindicate that to be true. And that's why today we have signs and wonders and powers working among us all over the world. This marvelous great bridge. Oh, my, as a, my colored friends used to sing, it's a highway to heaven, and we're walking up the king's highway. Truly, all over, Jesus has finished. Everything is completed. Jesus would have not sat down if he had not have completed the work. No man sits down until his job is over. That's right. And when Jesus 
took his blood and went through the heavens of heavens and condemned every devil, took the keys of death and hell, and sat down. When he died at Calvary, he bowed his head as far as the atonement was made and everything that you've got need of in this journey from earth to glory. He screamed, it is finished. There can be nothing else added to it, nothing else taken from it. That settles it. The Bible is finished. The plan of God is finished. The atonement is made. The devil is defeated. And the only thing we have to do is look and live. Brother, sister, tonight, may God of heaven help you to look and live as we pray now and bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we come to the close now of this little mixed-up message as a parable, but let the people, Lord, as take it home with them and ponder over it in their heart and knowing that we can rest assured if we're built on material out of the Bible. That every plan of our salvation comes from thus saith the Lord. And we know we're correct. And then, Father, I pray that in vindication of this that I have said, that there is none other, no other way under heaven, not other than another name given under heaven, that man must be saved only through the name of the Lord Jesus, who was the expansion between heavens and earth as he was expanded up there. He is the mighty tower. The name of the Lord is the mighty tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. We thank thee, Father, that we have found this. And I pray now that you'll bless tonight. And while we have our heads bound, I just wonder... If there would be someone in here who would say, Brother, a preacher, I believe that, every word of it. But I have built my theories maybe somewhere else on my automobile. I thought about paying for the home, educating my children. That's legitimate, my brother. That's a good thing. That has got not one thing to do with your eternal salvation. Oh, I joined church, Brother Brandon, but that hasn't got one thing to do with your salvation. Jesus never did ask anybody to join a church. No, sir. But you say, as far as being born again, well, Jesus said, except you're born again, you'll no wise enter into the kingdom, no matter how many churches you belong to, how good you are, how, how you've contributed to church, how you've took others to church, and how hard you've worked in the circles of the church. That won't have one thing to do with it. You'll say, I never even knew you. Except a man be born again of the Spirit and the water, he will in no wise enter into the kingdom. If you raise your hand to God at this time and say, God, I haven't accepted this, but I really want it in my heart. I want you, Brother Bram, to pray for me. And God, I want you to have mercy on me as I raise my hands to you. Would you raise your hand? God bless you. God bless you. You, you. Yes, just simply many, many raising your hands. Now remember, you don't do that in vain. See you, sister. You don't do that in vain. You can't. You cannot make one move towards God without Him telling you to do it. No man can come to me except my Father draws you. If something told you to do it, Jesus said, all the Father has given me when, before the foundation of the world, will come to me. Every one that's been given. The roadhouse might have had you a long time. The old coal formal church might have had you a long time. You might have listened to a social gospel, denied the power thereof for a long time. But don't worry, you're coming to Christ. If you believe, be sure to do it. And as you raise your hand and accept him, Say, God, be merciful to me. I now come by raising my hand. Only thing I know to do, God bless you. My, there are just many more hands went up then. Remember, I might not even see your hand, but he does. You know all of that. What kind of material are you built out of? Methodist? Baptist? Catholic? Presbyterian? Lutheran? Pentecostal? Nazarene, Pilgrim Holiness, if you're not built out of Bible, 
material, the boards drove on by the Holy Ghost, you better tear off the boards. Get built right. You believe that he hears my prayer? You believe that he seems can open the eyes of the blind through prayer? Can without a shadow of doubt know every thought that's in your heart and do the very same things he did when he was here on earth, standing here in our midst? Then you raise up your hand to him. I'll offer prayer for you. All right, God bless you. Any more? Our Heavenly Father, the speaking of the Word. It's hard on the tree sometimes to saw it out and shape it and prune it. But it must be did this way to bear fruit. So we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that every person, these dozen, that raise their hands to accept you, that you'll put their name right now in the Lamb's Book of Life. Engrave it out there in the middle of the air in that hand that was nailed to Calvary. Grant it, Lord, and may not one of them be lost. May every one of them safely arrive. May they come fully, wholeheartedly, and receive the Holy Spirit in their heart and be made anew by the renewing of their minds. Grant it, Father. May the Holy Ghost do this. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. That's so beautiful, I want to sing it once with you, you all together. Softly and tenderly. Let's just sing it now together. Softly and you just love that? It just seems like it just scours out your heart when it comes in. Softly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. I love those old-time songs, the old hymns of the church. I like it a better than a lot of this year, dancing around and things we have today. Right. I'm just an old-fashioned preacher. I, I just love the old-fashioned way. Dear my God to thee, Rock of Ages cleft for me. All those famous old songs, I believe they were inspired as the penman wrote them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Don't you believe that? 
I've watched those old Christians when they were going. Watch your face light up. They, I can see him, Brother Branham. Raise him up on my arm like this. Can you still see, Brother? Yes, he's wonderful. Go out to meet him. Oh, I love that. How many remembers Paul Rader? I'm sure you do. Remember what he said when he was dying, don't you? I remember remembers the last words of D.L. Moody, Abraham Lincoln, many of those men. The end tells the story. Now, Christian friend, our time is fleeting. Really late now. I, I realize I'm going to be responsible at the day of the judgment for my ministry. God gave me this ministry to win souls. Divine healing is just not for the healing of the body. It's to catch souls. See? The body may be healed. It'll get sick again. That's right. And it's got to die. But that soul once born and connected in the kingdom of God has eternal, everlasting life. When eons are all on, the eons of time, it'll still be the same. Now, what if this was all we had? That would be enough, wouldn't it? That's right. I want everyone that raised their hand to Christ tonight, as soon as the healing service is over, I want you to gather around the altar. I believe that right now you'd go to heaven if you died. I believe it. But to strengthen yourself. Listen to what Jesus said. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but done pass from death to life. That's what he said. That's not just emotion or a mental workup. That's when you really believe it. Way down in the mountains of Kentucky preaching, seeing an old shirt get patch on patch and smelly with perspiration. Set of steel gray eyes and hair hanging down his neck, need to shave, walk up in tears in his eyes. Look up and take a hold of my hand and say, Preacher, I really mean it. Brother, you can depend on it. It's there. Something's happened. That old fellow that would have shot you to drop your hat. Yes, sir. Would give the last drop of blood he's got for you now. That's right. Sincerely, we in the city, we get starchy. We just so, well, I'll go over to Dr. Jones. I got my name on the book over there. That don't do you one bit of good. That's right. That's right. Unless That's your name's written up there. That's right. That's right. You take God's material, God's Word, except the man be born again, he will in no wise come. Right. No wise can see. Now, we're so thankful for God for His Word. That's true. Now, His Word said, here's what His Word said. Let's see what it said. See if we got the church built on the right material. He said in the last days He'd pour His Spirit out. And young man would see visions, old man would dream dreams. On his hands made and made servant, he pour out of his spirit in that day. He'd show signs in the heaven and but and in the earth below. And Jesus before leaving in St. John uh, fourteen twelve, he said, Verily, verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Even greater than this, the word there greater, it means more, if you know. Uh, look it up in the translations. You find out in the original Hebrew word means more. You couldn't do greater. He raised the dead. He stopped nature. He done everything that could be done. See? So you couldn't do greater in quantity, but you could do more in quality because the Holy Spirit's going to spread the whole earth. And you know tonight, revival fires are on every hill in every nation. Right. It's a universal thing. Jesus is coming. He promised to this in the last days. And he said, another thing, a little while, think of this. The world won't see me no more. That's uh, too much of it. 70 or 80 percent. If we had the whole world gathered tonight and Christ would come here and perform, there'd be at least 80 percent of them go away and say, I don't believe it. That's right. It's a telepathy or something. They wouldn't believe it. He said, the world won't see me no more. But ye shall see me. For I will be with you to the end of the world. Not just through the Apostles' Age, not through the Wesley Age, not through the Lutheran Age, but every age to the end of the world. Then when the world began to come towards the end, the greatest climax supernatural 
at the end of every junction. There's always been miracles and things happen. But now is the greatest of all the world's history. What's going to take place now? Oh, it's wonderful. And to think that life will soon be over. And we have the absolute truth of the Bible that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's raised from the dead. And he's here with us. Not dead, but here. Here with us tonight. And now to you newcomers, I pray that God will make himself known to you if you're the first time in the meeting. How many here for their first time ever was in a meeting before? Many of you. God bless you. Happy to have you. Now, you see where I place the gospel? That there's no power in any man to heal, no power in any man to forgive sins. It was already done. It's a finished work. But if Jesus was standing here tonight himself, you'd ask him to heal you. You'd say, child of mine, can't you believe that I did that? I was wounded for your transgression. With my stripes you were healed. See? You were healed. Can't you believe that? Then what else could he do? By being the master of all the seers, the Lord of heaven, he might tell you something or do some supernatural something else that you'd recognize it would be scriptural and you'd know it was him, like he did through them at Emmaus. But himself, he said, I do nothing except the Father shows me first. What I see the Father doing, that I do also. He knew the people that come to him. They come to him and he talked to him a little while. He knew just exactly where the trouble was. Is that right? right. He told a woman one day just what her trouble was sitting there, and she said, well, this is the sign of the Messiah. We don't, don't know who you are, but we know that when Messiah cometh, he'll do these things. But who are you? The woman at the well. He told her about her, where her trouble was. He said, I'm he that speaks to you. She ran into the city and said, come see a man that told me what I've done. See? And when Nathaniel comes to Jesus, after Philip went and called him, and he was a staunch believer, he did, but he couldn't believe Jesus. He said, now look, could anything good to come out of Nazareth? He said, come and see. Yeah. Your little pastor here who's been so shook up, Brother Joseph, today walking with her arms around each other down to the seaside or the lakeside, he said, Brother Branham, my burdened heart, oh, my people, Chicago, I want to see it shook. I've never told him. I said, Brother Manson, I want to tell you something. You, you might not believe it. You might not believe it, but the thing that you prayed and wrestled on your pillow at night, the tears that you shed, the prayers, the long fastings that you went for with your hands up and something burning in your heart, oh God, do something for Chicago, do something. It's already done. He said, but Brother Branham, I, I want to see Chicago shook. I said, it's been shook. That's right. It's been shook. I said, the Bible said, all the prophets speaking of the coming of the Lord, of John the Baptist, that every mountain will be brought down, every low place will be brought up, all the rough places will be made clear. And what does that people think? Oh, angels will come down and they'll beat the drums and the bands and what a time we'll have out there. But what was it? A little old fuzzy-faced prophet come out of the wilderness with his beard sticking out like one of these your fuzzy worms. He had a, a big piece of sheepskin wrapped around him and a leather girl, about half dressed, preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right. Not even with shoes on, standing barefooted in mud, squashing up between your toes on the muddy banks of Jordan. And that's what the Bible called grace. That's right. Well, I said, Even if the trees all clapped their hands, the leaves did, and said the mountains skipped like little rams <laughs> when they knew this was taking place. But the, see what man calls great, God calls foolish. Right. What man calls foolish, God calls great. Chicago has been shook time after time. Right. And all the Father has given me will come. Oh, just obey God. How can a man come unless God calls? Advertised in the paper, if there would be five dead people raised from the grave tonight, 
and tomorrow morning we'd get that much space in the paper of it. Way over in the backside somewhere. Right. Sure. The world knows their own. What do you think Jesus would get tonight if he come in here and raise so many dead people? That's what he would get, just like he got to get. What would the what would the people the the so called Christians that go to these big orthodox places and don't believe in divine healing and just so they belong to church, what would they say? It's some kind of a trick. Oh, yeah. It's mental telepathy. Oh, yeah. They said the same thing back there about him. Right. They said, he's the Elzebub, he's the fortune teller. Don't hear nothing about that. Keep away from such. If anybody goes over that little click with his, why, well, we'll excommunicate him. But the Bible said the common people heard him gladly. The poor went to the same thing tonight. I'll say this, my brother. Chicago has been shook. <laughs> Don't you worry, Brother Matthew. God bless your little heart. You cried a many nights and prayed, and I've seen you fast till you look circles under your eyes. Don't worry. Your reward's waiting up there at the head of the ladder. That's right. But Chicago, you just don't see it. I don't, if looking at it natural, I wouldn't either. But when you look over here in that dimension, you see what's talking about. See? There's more done. God, no man can come until the Father's called. See? Why did Nathaniel run way over there, Philip, and get Nathaniel? See what I mean? You see one of, one of them. Now, Jesus is raised from the dead. He's here. If you've got eyes, may you see. If you've got ears to hear, may you hear. But if you haven't, you can't. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that there will be many in here tonight that will see, hear, and may it fall deep in their hearts, and may they believe. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right. Uh, he give out what you is hundred now indeed. There's a hundred prayer cards out and these these hundred prayer cards and these last night we call the first part. Let's go over and call it last part tonight. We had what was in the line like that? Fifteen wasn't it? About 15, just as many as I can get to in a night. I don't want you to stand in vain. I might not get to that many. I'll try my best. But let's take, that would be D85. Uh, 85, 85, 85. D85. Who has it? Raise up your hand. Anybody got D85? Would you raise up? 85, 86. Raise up your hand. 86. Line up over there. 87. Come this way, lady. 87. All right, 87, 88. All right, brother, over here to the right. 89. D89, do I make your hand? D89, all right, 90. Who has D90? 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, and 100. Let those people line up over here. And now, while we're lining up in the usher, brother, would you feel happy in there? Somebody, so we can hurry and, and preserve the time. I want to talk to the audience. Now, I want you to look this way just a minute. Now, especially to the newcomers. I want to say this. If Jesus Christ, if my gospel that I preach of his word is the truth, then how many believe that the Bible said in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe it? All right. Then, how many know this, that Jesus Christ, now we're talking about him yesterday, when he was here on earth, what he is today and what he will ever be. When Jesus Christ was here on earth, the Son of God, manifested, God manifested in flesh, being Emmanuel, when he was here on earth, he did not claim to be a healer. Let's see your hand. How many knows the Bible said he was a healer? How many knows the Bible said this? It's not me that doeth the work. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the work. How many? All right? That he did not claim to be a healer. How many knows this again? That when he was here on earth, he made this statement and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself. But what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. That's 
Then when Jesus, at St. John 5, 19, 5, 19, when he passed through that pool where all them crippled and blind and lame was laying there, he went to a man the Father had showed him where this man was lame. And he went to this man, he know he'd been sick for all this time, and 38 years, and so he, he told him that he was healed, and he picked up his bed and walked, and the Jews found him, and questioned him about it being the Sabbath and so forth. But he, he only did as the Father showed him. Then, do you believe that he was full of mercy, full of compassion, had mercy on the people? Then how could he have mercy on the people and pass by all them lame, blind, caught, lame, and afflicted, and not heal them? Because they don't know, you, you wouldn't know what mercy means, what compassion means. It's like I've always said about love. There's two different kinds of love. Do you believe that? Some people get them mixed up. Like some people in being born to the Holy Spirit, they get mixed up in the new spirit, as Jeremiah said that. God said, in their last days, I'll write my spirit upon their heart, I'll write my law in their heart, and I will give them a new spirit, and then he said, I'll give them my spirit. And many people get the new spirit, well, you have to have a new spirit, you can't even get along with your neighbor, let alone with God. See? So you have to have a new spirit before you can get along with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when you get the new spirit, you think then that you've got the Holy Spirit, but it isn't. It's the new spirit. The Holy Spirit will witness Jesus Christ. But if you just joined church, went up and knew that you should do right, that's just the new spirit. That's just the spirit God gave you, but not his spirit yet. See? You come into Christ by the Holy Spirit baptism. First Corinthians 13 says, By one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Spiritual baptism into the body of Christ. Then you're secured with Christ. He doesn't amputate any arms, legs, or eyes, or anything of his body. He's perfect. And you can't be perfect, but as long as you're in Christ, you are perfected by his vicarious suffering and death at the cross. God doesn't see your sins. He sees nothing but one perfect person, the body of Jesus Christ. He can't. That's the reason Balaam, the hiring prophet, thought surely God would curse Israel because look at the things they had done wrong. But he fails to see the smitten rock and the brass serpent going before them, making atonement. God couldn't see through the atonement. His blood had answered its place. See? All right? Now, look this way. And believe. Jesus one day was going to a crowd. Now you say, Brother Bram, what do you take so much time for? It's best that you would understand thoroughly one thing than to haphazardly uh, chew up a lot of things and you wouldn't understand it. See? Look, Jesus was going to a crowd of people and everybody was all around him. And a little woman touched his garment and walked away and hid herself out in the audience. And Jesus stopped and said, Who touched me? Now, he did not feel that on the border of his garment. Touch the hem of your skirt down at the end of it and find out if you do, or your overcoat down at the end and see. Let somebody touch your overcoat and see if you feel it. Certainly not. But he felt it, the touch that she supernaturally made. It was her face that touched him. Closely, now listen, don't miss it. Her face touched him. He said, who touched me? Everybody denied it. She denied it too. All tonight. Who touched me? Nobody knows. He said, but somebody's touched me. He said, I've got weak. Virtue gone from me. Virtue is strength. I got weak. Everybody denied it. Peter said, Lord, who touched you? Well, the whole multitude's touching you. But it was a different touch. Finally, be the king and lord of the seers. He looked to the audience until he found the woman. And he said, Thy faith that saves thee, the blood issue. And then she ran and fell down at his feet and confessed everything, how she had done it. He said, Daughter, be of a good cheer. Thy faith has saved thee. 
That was Jesus yesterday. Now, that if he, that was Jesus yesterday, and he's got to be Jesus the same today if the Bible's true and we know it is, then how could we touch him today? Say, Brother Branham, you said he's a fundamentalist. What about the scripture for that? The Bible says that he is a, our high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. Is that right? Then if your, that woman's face could touch him, then what was she touching? Not Jesus. She touched his clothes. But what did she really touch? She touched God. And she, Jesus didn't know who it was. The Father hadn't shown him that. But she drew from God her desire, and Jesus was God's mouthpiece. So he spoke to her what she'd done it and how she'd done it, and told her she was healed. Now, Jesus has gone away and sitting in the presence of God with his own blood as a high priest. Now, he has to use his church tonight for mouthpiece. Is that right? Take no thought what you shall say, for it's not you that speaketh, but your Father that dwelleth in you. He speaketh. Then your faith touches God, and people are born in the world, some to be apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. God sets those in church. Is that right? Then he's got people that can preach the gospel, teach the word, be a missionary. Of an apostle is a missionary. Both the same word, someone is See, Why you ever desire to be called a missionary, I don't know. A missionary is an apostle. And how a was sent. And all these God has put in the church, then how does he touch? How do you touch? You say, oh, heavenly Father, in my heart, I, I'm sick, I need. Oh, I believe that Jesus died for me, and his blood was shed at Calvary. He was wounded for my transgressions. That I have confessed, and I believe you. And with his stripes, I am healed. And they say that that blood is before you, that he is the high priest making intercessions on my confession, and I confess that I believe you. Now, great high priest, can I touch you with the feeling of my infirmities? I want to be healed for your glory. Speak. Then he speaks to his servant, turns to you. You who had so-and-so, you back there, you up there, who had so-and-so, you've been suffering with a certain thing for a certain time or something like that, or if you've done this or that or whatever it is, your faith has made you whole. What did that? Your faith never touched the preacher, it touched Christ. Christ worked back by the Holy Ghost to you. The preacher didn't know what he was saying, it was the Holy Ghost speaking. You believe that? Now that's for you. The rest of it, we'll call here, all right? As the lady comes. Now, be, I'm going to ask you one thing, friend. They, I'm going to ask the brethren, just let me stand a short time. Remember? It's another world. Just outside, do you believe that in this room that you can't see with your natural eyes, that there's angels? Yes. You believe God's here? Yes. Well, I, you can prove, uh, electronics can prove that television's in this room. You believe that? Yes. You don't see it. Voices through radios in this room from the transmitter. Is that right? But we say that there is a resurrected Christ that's alive, and we're only his transmitter. So if Christ is in the room, and he's a God of the human race, surely he has some way he can contact his beings, don't you think? Certainly he does. Now, he's here. Now, be reverent. Be in prayer. Sit quiet. Don't move around. Just sit real still, if you will, for the next about 15 minutes. They'll dismiss the audience probably in the next 15, 20 minutes. But don't move. But sit there and be. Don't think about nothing but Christ. Just say, Oh, Lord Jesus, I believe you. And maybe his Father will have mercy on me. I trust that he will. Now be reverent and be in prayer. Now, here's a woman standing here. Or I want you to look at me just a moment, sister. We're strangers to one another, I suppose. But God knows both of us. I don't know you. You don't know me. So... Uh, God knows us both. Is that right? 
And if you're just a woman and they give out a car, a prayer card to either last night or tonight, and, and you, when a number was called, that was your number, and you just come up here. That's, that's all there is to it. Is that right? I never seen you, never know you, and you never know me. We're born probably miles apart and years apart, and here's our first time meeting. But there's someone here who knows you. There's someone here who knows me. You are a woman. I'm a man. You are a Christian. I'm a Christian. And the spirit between us is the Holy Spirit. And that spirit is trying, you're trying to contact that spirit for something I don't know what. It might be finances. It might, I don't know what in the world you're here for. God does know. He knows what in this great universe that you need. I don't. But if Jesus has raised from the dead, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, there was a woman came to him one time drawing some water in St. John 4. And Jesus said, bring me a drink. I wonder why he wanted a conversation with her. Contact her spirit. And he said, bring me a drink. She said, it's not customary for Jews to ask the American stuff. I have any dealings. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. And I'll bring, give you water, you don't come here to draw. The conversation went on about where the worship at and so forth. What was Jesus doing? Contacting her spirit. He was on his road to Jericho, but he went up by Samaria, way up in the hills, way away from Jericho, because the Father told him to go up there. He sat down and sent his disciples away because the Father had said so. He said he did nothing until the Father showed him. Now, then the woman, as you're talking to her, he found where her trouble was. And he said, go get your husband. She said, I have none. said, that's right. She got fine. Now, what did she say? She said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. That we know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. She ran into the city and said, come see the man that told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Christ? Now, if he's, that was the sign of the Messiah. Is that right? If that was the sign of the Messiah then, it's the sign of the Messiah now. What did the world say about it? What did the church say about it? They said he's a spiritualist. He's a devil, Beelzebub. But what did she say? He's the Messiah. What did Nathaniel say when he told him? What did Peter say when he even told him his name? He said, you're the son of God, the king of Israel. Now, that's the same thing now, sister. You can only say it. And if it's done, I don't say it will be. But if it is, it'll be a sign to you and a sign to this church that Jesus Christ is alive tonight and not dead. He's alive. It will not heal you. It'll take your faith in him to heal you. Healing only comes through your individual faith in him or your desire in him to get what you want. But he can speak through me. And me knowing nothing about it, it has to take supernatural to do it. That's right. Now, I trust the audience understands this. And may you be real reverent, for I know the Holy Spirit is coming across from my right-hand side at this time. And now, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I minister in his name for his glory, that the people might know that Jesus Christ is still alive after 1900 years and will be forever the same. If the audience can still hear my voice, I see the woman moving away, and she is very nervous, just extremely upset, and her nervous is a nervous of fear. She's scared, and she's always beset of those things. They can't find out, even the doctors, what causes it. They don't know what it is. And this very day, she's been somewhere for this. And that was to a hospital. And she goes into the hospital, and she's having x-rays taken. And that x-rays is of the spine yes. and in the leg, yes. so that the doctor is trying to find out what is wrong with the woman. Right. That 
that is the truth. Thus saith the Lord. Now, whatever was told you was the truth, was it? Yes. If it is, raise up your hand. Then Jesus has risen from the dead. Yes. The last words he said when he ascended up, These signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Amen. There's something here that knows you that is right. There's something here, and I can tell you now where your trouble is. It's a spasm in the nerve. That's exactly right. True. You feel relieved, don't you? <laughs> For you're healed. Your faith has made you well. Not go on your own. Now, you see, I never even touched you. Your faith made you well. And you know now that he's raised from the dead. God bless you. Have faith in God. Hallelujah. Have faith in God. Don't that. How do you do? We are strangers to each other, I suppose, ladies. We do not know each other. And then another picture of that the time that I was just quoting. A colored lady, white man. And it was a Jew and a Samaritan between Jesus and a Samaritan woman. And there was a racial affair in them days, and it's always been because of the color of a person's skin. But Jesus let her know that there was no difference in God. We're all God's children. Right. All the offsprings of Adam. That's right. The countries we was raised in, it turned off different colors, it has nothing to do with our Creator. He is Almighty God who made us. And he made us after His own way in his own design, in his own fashion. God is a God of variety. Do you believe that, lady? If God only had white flowers, we would think he was uh, uh, just believed, just wanted one color. But he has white flowers, red flowers, blue flowers, all kinds of flowers. That's the way he made his people. White, black, brown, yellow, all different colors. God is a God of variety. He loves it. He makes big mountains and little mountains. He makes prairies. He makes deserts. He makes lakes and seas. Big trees, little trees. He's a God of variety. He makes us the way we are. So what are you doing, Brother Brandon? Contacting your spirit. Because you're in a dangerous condition. That is true. You've had much trouble. And your trouble is in your throat. Trying. You've had it for some time. I see you moving. You're going somewhere. You're asleep or something. They got you laying back in a white thing over you. Or it's an operation. The doctors have stuffed your tonsils out. But still, you don't know where that's it or not. That's right. That isn't it. You're an allergic to a plant. That's true. Now, you believe now? Now, he who knows you, you believe that he can make you well. Let me have your hand just as a point of contact. Oh, God, here is one of Simon's children, the one that helped you bear the cross of Golgotha. Your servants, the doctors, have tried all they can for her, but they failed to find this enemy. But you know him, and he's exposed right here now. So in the name of Jesus Christ, thou enemy of this woman's life, come out of her. You can't hide from God. Leave her for the glory of God. In the name of the Son of God, amen. Now, sister, he who knows what was surely will know what will be. Go and be happy and rejoice. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. How do you do? Do you believe? All your heart. Very well. How? The Holy Spirit left the altar.
So you are praying for that lung trouble, wasn't you, lady? You touched me. Having trouble in your lungs. Stand up on your feet just a minute. The lady right here. All right. Jesus Christ makes you well, sister. Your faith touched him. He's the high priest that can be touched by the feelings of your infirmity. Amen. Just pray. Challenge your faith. Believe it with all your heart. Jesus said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. Do you believe he's raised from the dead now? Now have faith. Just say, Lord, have mercy on me. Maybe my faith has been mental faith. Maybe it's been emotional. But now, let me calm down. Let me believe you, Lord. Let me believe you. Now, I don't know you, lady. There's no way of me knowing you because we're strangers to one another. But Christ knows us both. He knows me and he knows you. And someday you and I will have to stand in his presence. Warn to a thing if we're not deep and sincere in our hearts. Trouble with your back, haven't you? Sitting out on the end of the road. The third row out there at the end. If you believe, yes, sir. I've seen you trying to get up, holding your back and trying to work and stoop over. Those things are true, sir. If it is, shake your hands back and forth so the audience can see it. You were praying to God and said, God, let me be included in this. If that's right, shake your hands again. Your faith has saved you, brother. Amen. Have faith in God, Christian friends. Believe Him. Pardon me, lady. I can only move as He moves me. You understand that, do you? Yes, just as He moves. You're not here for yourself. You're here for someone else. And that is a relative of yours. A grandchild. That's right. And there's something wrong with the blood. I see him taking it back and forth to the hospital and giving it blood transfusion, and it won't work. And you're standing for this child. There's something to do with you about a Catholic. You are a Catholic. That's right. Well, great is your faith, sister. May I have this? Eternal Jehovah, who raised up Jesus from the dead, the doctors have failed, but thou cannot fail, Lord. You are eternal God. I bless this handkerchief for the intended purpose that I send it for the healing of the one that's sick. And when it's placed upon the one that it is going to, may the evil move out. And may they be healed in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, lady, when you see this come to pass, you serve the Lord with all your heart and live for him. Don't doubt you can have what you ask for. God bless you. May you be praise thankful to God and serve him. All. God bless you. How do you do, sir? We are strangers to each other. I don't know you, you don't know me, as far as I know. But we're strangers. If we are, raise your hand.
Uh, just be real reverent. Don't get up if you can for a few moments. See, you're each one a soul. You each one got a spirit. There's people praying and just moving. You'd be surprised. Why do I get weak? Why am I trimming? Why is I'm sweating here on this cool night? You should stand here once. You have known. Here's the man standing here. Just ask him. Him standing this close to the anointing and the spirit between us. There is a feeling on you, sir. That's very calm and welcome and loving. If that's right, wave your hands to the people like this. See? Right between he and I. How many has ever seen a picture of it? That pillar of fire that they've got from Washington, D.C. That's what's between he and I now. The man's a stranger. I don't know him. Christ does. But, sir, I see your shadow of the darkness. I see them taking you into a, a building. Of, it's a hospital. And you had an operation. Then you had another operation. And they were for cancer. And the cancer remained. The doctor had failed to get it. But he can't hide from Jesus. You're not from this city. You're from a smaller city in this. That's from, I re, look like I've seen the, it's Rockford, Illinois. It's where you're from. And your name is Leonard, I believe they call you. Rango. Rango. And your address is 3034H Street. Now, I say this because you have faith, you're shattered with death. Do you believe that Jesus Christ sent you? Who knows how to call Cephas, Peter? Yes. You believe it? Yes. Then there's some kind of a spirit got me anointed. Do you believe it to be the Son of God? Yes. Come here. Oh, Jesus, Son of God, let thy Holy Ghost move into this man and heal him, and may his life be spared, and I condemn the devil that's killing him. May it leave him this night, and may he get well. Go home and be happy, and eat and live. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and God shall raise them up. Amen. Go on your road and rejoice. Jesus Christ, God does his great, holy, redemptive work. Have faith. Don't doubt. Just believe. <laughs> Bless the law. I don't know you, my brother. I've never seen you. That's right. But one day, Philip went and got a man by the name of Nathaniel and brought him to the Lord Jesus. And Jesus, as soon as he seen him, he seen his sincerity. In his honesty, he said, Behold an Israelite. And I say unto you, Behold a Christian, honest, sincere. You're noted even with your people for being a sincere Christian. That's true, sir. That's right. You're shattered by a cancer. The cancer is the neck. That's right. You're not from this country. No. You come from somewhere else, didn't you? Ohio, Cleveland, Dryden. Your name's Emerson, isn't it? I'll go back. Jesus Christ, God's eternal love, heal you, my brother, and make you well. Have faith. Have faith in God. You want to get over that diabetes and be made well? Jesus Christ, do you believe it? Come here. Oh, God.
God, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life, giver of every good gift, send thy blessing upon the woman who I bless in thy name. In Jesus' name may she be healed. Amen. No doubt. Believe. That's a wonderful name you're wearing. Nervousness is a horrible thing. Keeps you tore up all the time. Of course, you was born nervous. All your life you've been nervous. I see even as a schoolgirl nervous. Nothing can help it. Everybody says, get next to yourself. Well, that don't do no good. Can't help it, sister. There's something that frights you. But Jesus Christ is sure to take it from you. Do you believe it? God, as I lay my hand upon this young lady here, just in the prime of life, I curse this affliction on her body. She wants to serve you, Lord, and serve you in freedom. And I take it away from her in the name of Jesus Christ. May it go and never return again for God's glory. Amen. I don't fear, young lady. Look, will you do as I tell you now? You feel all right at this time. See, because it's gone. When you come up here, there's a dark shadow around you. It's gone now. It scares you. You can't help it. It comes to you. But look, now the unclean spirit's gone from you. He walks in dry places. He'll try to return again. But you just take my word as God's prophet. Don't you never have a frown on your face. Sing all day long and praise God, no matter how you feel or what takes place, it'll leave you and won't come no more. I go through that. I believe it all the way. Hallelujah. 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 How would I know that except God told me that? Do you believe me now? That's a killer. Kill more people than anything else. But Christ is a Savior. They that walked up right before God, he said he would hold those good things from them. You promised him to do this? Walk up right before him all the days of your life if he'll spare you. Then come here and let me pray for you. God, who knows her, who would know this woman's condition just the same as you did the woman at the well, send your blessings on her and bless her and spare her life as I ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. The affectional, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5, 15. That's right. Now, we're not righteous. No man is righteous, only the Son of God. So we don't stand, and I don't stand in my righteousness. I stand in His righteousness. So as long as I'm anointed with Him, it's the affectional, fervent prayer of the righteous Christ interceding for you through me to have you to believe. Do you believe that? Then your heart trouble's gone. Go and be blessed for the glory of God. <laughs> Lady, do you believe me? Do you believe me to be the servant of the Son of God, a point of contact to the great high priest, a lip for him to speak to, or an eye for him to look through? Then if he can use my eyes for his power, he could tell me your life, could he? more I talk to you, more will be revealed. I'm getting weak. But if he will just tell me what you're here for, will you accept it? You don't look at to look at, but you're shattered. Let me tell you, you weaken late in the evening, don't you? Sit down. Perspiration runs from you at night. It's a two burglar. It's right. And only God can make you well. That is right. Will you believe that's the first disease that God heals? Consumption. Will you believe now that Jesus Christ has raised from the dead and shared this platform in a supernatural way? Yes, I believe. May your eyes be opened as the servant at Dawson when Elijah was standing out. Oh, Jehovah, eternal God, send your blessings upon this daughter and heal her and make her well. In Jesus Christ's name we curse this disease. Amen. God bless you, sister. Don't die, but believe. Don't believe. Just a moment. Sir, just trouble.
horrible enemy. Sitting right here at the end. Tumor next to you. Yes. You have chest trouble, the colored man sitting there. That's right. Just let me see this line. Why do all you colored people sitting here? Do you believe? Do you believe me to be his prophet? Though being a white man, you believe it anyhow? All right, look at me and believe. The whole line of you. Sir, you have chest trouble. You have tumor. The lady with her hands up has a nervous trouble. The next lady has a stomach trouble. The next lady has a, a nervous trouble. Raise your hand if it's right. The next lady has arthritis. Is that right? Lady with cancer is sitting by me. He's here. Jesus Christ, God's son. Do you believe it? And he who knows who's raised from the dead, who knows all things, life is here. Death cannot stand in the presence of life. If you believe this with all your heart, if you believe you are there that a psalmist that can't sleep, do you believe that God makes you well? Then you can have the same thing. All that believes that Jesus Christ is here, and if he or she regardless of what's wrong with you, stand up on your feet, raise up your hands, and praise him in Jesus.